give you now as a, as a, as a background to a philosophical foundation that can give us an alternative, completely alternative framework to neoclassical theory. But it's a big, big shift. But I'll start first of all with Minsky's hypothesis, which I think is quite simple to explain verbally. So you start, you're looking at an economy in historical time. And of course, history and time are two things neoclassical economics doesn't include. So we've got history and time inside there. And because you're in historical time, there's been a crisis in the recent past. Now, the most obvious crisis for us now is 2008. Okay, 2007, 2008 crisis. In the aftermath of that crisis, both banks and, borrow and firms and, and borrowers in general are conservative about debt. People don't want to have debt after the crisis. And therefore, they only, the only projects that get funded are projects which have been worked out very conservatively. Okay? But because the economy has recovered, most of those conservatively estimated projects actually succeed. So the success rate is higher than people expected it to be. And that because the firms therefore make more money than they thought, and the banks have less bad debts than they expected, both firms and banks reduce their risk premium. They're not so worried about debt anymore. So the accepted ratio of debt to equity starts to rise again. And you start to put a higher valuation on assets, which you can see happening globally around the world so soon after the 2008 crisis. Now, for a while, what you get is very positive aspects of that. Because you have a decline in aversion to risk or uncertainty, you have increased investment. Because investment makes the economy grow faster, that partly validates the higher risk that people are taking. Then asset prices start to rise, so it becomes profitable to buy assets and sell them on a rising market and to be, take leverage positions, borrow large amounts of money to buy a house or a large amounts of money to buy shares. And what you also get, because we're living in a world of endogenous money, where lending money create, lending, lending creates money, the increased willingness to lend actually increases the money supply. So there's an actual physical increase in the amount of money in circulation, which of course enables riskier investments to occur and enables more speculation on assets to occur. And you finally get what are called Ponzi uh, investors. I have Bondi uh, in the quote there because there's an Australian uh, speculator called Alan Bond who was a major Ponzi schema in the 87 stock market uh, bubble and property but my bubbles in Australia, so I often refer to him in Australian audiences. And what a Ponzi investor is, is someone whose cash flow from investments is less than their debt servicing costs. So they may have borrowed, say, a billion dollars to buy a property development. They're paying $100 million in rent. Uh, sorry, they're, they're earning $100 million in rent from it. They're, they're paying $150 million in debt service. So they're losing money all the way through. The only way they can make a profit is by selling the asset for a greater price. So they're absolutely dependent upon rising asset prices. Now, that works for a while. But they have a desperate demand for money because fundamentally they're always insolvent. The cash coming in is less than the cash going out at all times for Ponzi investors. They only succeed because they can make a capital asset sale, cover the difference and make a profit. And my favourite example there, I'll, I'll just digress with an example, is an Australian <coughs> speculator called Christopher Scase. Now, you wouldn't know of him, okay, he's dead. Um, now, but in the 1980s, he made a takeover bid for one of America's major movie, movie studios. And one of the executives on that movie studio didn't trust him. So he, he went and did an investigation of Scase's finances and worked out he was losing money. He said, this guy cannot finance taking over the company, don't sell it to him. So Scase made a takeover bid for three billion dollars to buy this company, and the bid was turned down. The very next week, Scase went bankrupt because he couldn't pay a twelve million dollar loan instalment. Okay, so he offered three billion dollars one week, and went bankrupt because he couldn't pay twelve million dollars the week after. Okay? But if he managed to buy that movie house for three billion. He would have borrowed three and a half billion, 
paid three billion to buy the company and used small change from the other 500 million to pay the 12 million dollar loan and stock and it kept on going. So they are they're desperate demand for money because they've got to service debt before asset sales occur and if they don't do it they fold. So they have an incredibly insensitive demand for money. They will pay any rate of interest to get money when necessary. And Christopher's case, for example, in the 1980s, paid up to 25% interest per annum on debts in the, in the billions of dollar ranges, which was about twice the market rate, just to make sure he, he got, that, got that money. So initially, they make a, a profit because with this reduced sensitivity of, to debt and so on, there's a huge supply of finance. And you then get rising market interest coming out of that as well. But ultimately, one of many things can happen. The Ponzi's are necessarily losing money. Okay? They're always losing money. Um, so long as their shares continue rising, they're okay, but they can fall over in the middle of a boom. If, they just, if that time gap between taking out a new debt and having to service it and then selling an asset to make a profit, if they make a time mistake in that stage, they can collapse. Many of the investments people get into at that stage are based on what Minsky calls euphoric expectations. They're not going to work out. I, I, I have a. Do you know what's called Rastafarian hairdos? You know what a Rastafarian looks like? You know, you, you know reggae music. <laughs> okay, reggae music is uh, uh, people like Bob Marley. Was, okay, Rastafarian hairdos are made by putting cow shit on your head. Okay, seriously. Okay, apparently it's part of what causes the hairdo to occur. So my, my example of euphoric expectation would be somebody who decides to buy large amounts of cow, cow dung because they think they can make a fortune making Rastafarian hairdos. Okay? They, they'll borrow the money, somebody will believe them during a boom, it'll fail. Okay? Because it fails, that debt collapses. So you get truly ridiculous investments. The, the best, the more practical example than that, do you remember what's called the dot-com bubble in America? Okay. Well, the dot-com bubble had companies which were being sold for huge amounts of money on the stock exchange that were losing money. And people were saying, oh, it'll make a profit ultimately. But the valuations were ridiculous. So you get these ridiculous valuations. There's lots of loss-making investments taking place, and they can accumulate. You also get potentially rising rates, and that can mean that projects which were actually conservative, so they were going to meet their cash flow obligations, suddenly find they can't service them. And they will think, oh, well, there's a huge market for assets, let's sell assets. But the market is much more fragile than they expect. So those new goods come onto the market, floods the market, and prices collapse. And as soon as that trend of rising asset prices breaks, the whole system can come crashing down because the very first ones to fail are the Ponzi's. They could only succeed because they could sell into a rising market. Since they can't sell into a rising market, they're the first ones to panic and often the first ones to fail because that debt servicing cost is far greater than their cash flows. Asset prices collapse, the debt to equity ratios increase, the expansion of the money supply stops, goes negative quite frequently. Investment evaporates, growth slows down, and you're back where you started. You're going to go from one debt-induced crisis to another. So that's the, that's the verbal model that Minsky has. And he says, what about, let's look at some of the circumstances can, that can apply. What if you have high inflation when this all happens? This was the case back in the 1970s. There was a bubble, 1973 I mentioned as a period of crisis, the inflation rate was very high in 1973 because of very high wage demands and also because of OPEC. OPEC increased the price of oil from $2.50 a barrel to $10 a barrel overnight. So a dramatic increase in oil prices and high inflation. Wages were rising in America and Australia at more than 10% per annum, as high as 17% in one year. So that gave you high inflation. Kominsky well, said that will enable you to repay debts just because the price level is rising. Okay? If prices are rising in general, even if the economy is depressed, those rising prices will give you a cash flow that means you can service your debts. But you'll have slow economic growth because nobody is investing. So this is an ex explanation of what was called stagflation. 
stagnation in the economy at the same time as high inflation. And of course you'll have a cycle starting again once those debt levels are reduced in terms of the ratio of debt to income. What about low inflation? If low inflation is happening, you can't repay those debts and you get a chain, re chain reaction of bankruptcies. For somebody going bankrupt can mean someone who is not speculative but was owed money by the person who went bankrupt themselves falls. So there's a chain reaction effect from bankruptcies. And you have depressed activity as well, so that's the explanation of a depression. So the circumstances, combined inflation uh, with, the, with the debt crisis, a period of stagnation. If you have low inflation with the debt crisis, you can have a depression, which is what, what uh, Fisher explained at the time. What about big government's role? Well, Minsky said that what the government does by, by its spending being anti-cyclical, it gives firms the capacity to repay debt they wouldn't otherwise have. So because the government taxation revenue falls during a slump and government spending increases because more people are unemployed, welfare payments go up, that gives a cash injection that enables people in debt to service their debts. So you'll get a cycle again out of big government, but the big government will stop a serious slump occurring. So I actually go through models of all this and I'll cover those in my next lecture, showing how you can pull all this together and, and get this out of very, very simple cyclical models of the economy. But what I want to now do, and this is where I'm going to start getting very deep, is go into what I see as the real foundations of Minsky. And they are Schumpeter's vision of the economy as a cyclical system. I highly recommend reading Schumpeter. The, the book I most recommend is called Theory, but the Theory of Economic Development. That's the key reference to read from Schumpeter. Uh, but also Marx's philosophy. So I'm going to give you an approach to Marx you've never heard before, uh, which I think can explain where, where Minsky's overall vision comes from and how we can get an integrated vision for a modern approach to economics from Marx without the labour theory of value. This is Joseph Schumpeter, serious looking man. And he accepted the neoclassical position as an accurate description of an economy at rest. But he said it is a vision of an economy at rest. It's a static picture. And he says it, it can't handle processes of change. So he was quite right about this. He said we, what he tends to do is say, well, let's let the static theory explain equilibrium, but we need an explanation for non-equilibrium processes. And he sees capitalism as fundamentally unstable, the same argument as Minsky, but this is very important. Instability is not a bad thing. It's a good thing in Schumpeter's vision. Okay? Because instability leads to change. So it's, he's not... Uh, Minsky's argument about instability is the, like the negative sides of instability. Schumpeter sees the positive sides of instability. And he uses this to explain why capitalism is cyclical in the very first place as well. So he said, he looked at the, the neoclassical vision that he was, he accepted as an accurate description of a stable economy, but he says, the system we live in is inherently unstable. He says, there's no such thing as a stable social system. And I think China is a perfect place in which to say that. Okay? Because if any society is seeing huge change in its social structure and it's still going through it, it's China. He said, any system transforms itself simply by its mere working. And if history teaches us nothing else, it teaches that. So I think a very strong message about the fundamental nature of change in human society. And it was very well put by an economist called Ed Nell, one of the, one of the great non-orthodox economists. He talks about growth, but he calls it transformational growth. So growth just isn't an increase in quantity, it's a transformation as well of the nature of production, the nature of behaviour, nature of culture. So we have not just physical growth, but transformational, qualitative growth as well. And the phrase creative destruction also came from Schumpeter. So growth leads to social change. And progress causes destruction of the old means of production and also old social arrangements. And again, China is a brilliant country to, to talk about that in. So what you have, I'm going to use the word dialectical a lot in this part of the lecture, is that prosperity contains the seeds of its own destruction 
but also its own recreation. So cyclical behaviour necessarily comes out of this uh, the vision of the economy and indeed the real, real world. So he says, let's imagine you've got some new thing being built. You have some new technology. For example, let's say a new approach to building solar cells. So dramatic improvement in the efficiency of solar cells. As you're building and financing that technology, there's a super normal level of expenditure. You're borrowing money, you're investing money, you're hiring workers, you're buying capital equipment. You boost activity when you're building this new thing. But when it's then being produced, it comes out and it undercuts, for example, the profitability of coal-fired power stations. People lose their jobs in power coal-fired power stations. Profit declines, investment declines there. You start competing. So in the construction phase, the new thing causes a boom. When it's being sold, the new thing causes a slump in the rest of the economy. And he said that's the way in which progress is accomplished in capitalism and the old eliminated. Okay? It's not a bad thing, it's just the nature of change in a capitalist economy. And what you will therefore get is cycles. Okay? And people's expectations will be out of phase with the economy itself. And this is something that George Soros has exploited very, very well. He says, when everybody observes value and profits to increase, what you will do is project this rate of increase into the future. Again, very similar to Keynes's arguments on the same front. He said, you'll enter into commitments which turn out to be ill-conceived and untenable as soon as that rate of increase is interrupted. Now, equally, if you do it first, when everybody else is expecting things to be negative, you might come out ahead. Okay? So contrarian behaviour is rewarded frequently. So he had a conventional interpretation of mainstream analysis. He accepted the neoclassical idea of utility, uh, maximising consumers, and pro marginal productivity theory. He accepted Say's law applying, all these sorts of things. And this is looking at the equilibrium vision. He says, some, if you look at it from an equilibrium point of view, then every demand has an awaiting supply. There's no commodities that don't have people demanding them. Sellers appear again as buyers. Everything is in nice equilibrium. That's the conventional vision. But there are no profits. He said, if you look at the neoclassical model properly, then if the capitalist paid its marginal product and labor's paid its marginal product, and you have constant returns to scale, which the theory needs to assume, then the prices of everything resolve into the price you pay for capital and the price you pay for labor. He said, overall, there's no net profit. But he says, capitalism is driven by profit. So where does it come from? And also in this vision, money is just a bailover barter. He said, if you look at this conventional vision, just circulation of commodities, money plays no essential role. And he uses money as a gold equivalent at that stage. But he says, profit actually comes from discontinuous change and disequilibrium. So that's the source of profit. And you can't explain that with a, with an equilibrium, with a static theory. So he said, static analysis, which again is the neoclassical vision, can neither explain the reproductive revolutions themselves, nor what they cause, the cycles that he's now talking about. He said, it can only talk about one equilibrium after another equilibrium. It can't talk about the transition. And in Schumpeter's vision, the transition happens all the time. So to explain it, you have to have an evolutionary view of how capitalism functions. And he said, with an evolutionary point of view, two two facts are essential. The first, that historical change. Change always occurs. And the second, that it's not a circular process, nor is it a pendulum process. It's something which is transformational. It changes, but you never get back to where you started. Okay? Now, we, because we work in mathematics, in our thinking frequently, and I'm guilty of this as much as anybody, you tend to talk about a cycle where GDP is measured just in numerical terms. But if you think of what GDP consists of now versus what GDP was 50 years ago, it's qualitatively totally different. Okay? So the transformational nature of change is something that Schumpeter emphasises, and you can't capture that in mathematical models. Okay? You might have multi-agent models in some ways, but the qualitative change is a very hard thing to, to incorporate. So he said, what you get is spontaneous and discontinuous change. And forever disturbing equilibrium, forever being different. You can't talk about a restoration of equilibrium 
because A of one happened and being on new equilibrium will involve totally different behaviours to what happened beforehand. So he said, how do you make a profit? If you can't make a profit in equilibrium, he said, well, you can make a profit by introducing a new good that undercuts other goods. So you bring in MP3 players rather than, uh, DV, rather than uh, DVD players. You have a new method of production, so you find a new way of making an existing technology. You open up a new market. You have a new source of supply, so you find a different source of raw materials. Or you reorganise an industry, which is not often a source of profit, but you have those five basic ideas. And he said that his way of modelling was to say, let's assume that entrepreneurs are not involved in existing firms. That means, therefore, being not in existing firms, they have no money. Okay, so an entrepreneur is somebody with a good idea, but no money. Now, this is actually a very difficult assumption because it's often the case that entrepreneurial activity occurs inside existing firms that already have money. Okay? So it's harder to explain entrepreneurial growth using his assumption. So rather than making it easier to explain how entrepreneurs get money, he makes it harder to explain how entrepreneurs get money. That's the way you should use assumptions. Okay? Clarify your argument by making it actually more difficult to explain what you're talking about than the actual real world is. So when you include the real world, you're actually embellishing your argument. You're not contradicting your argument. So he said, you assume, first of all, that entrepreneurs aren't in existing firms, and secondly, that they're not using any unemployed resources. So you have a full empl fully employed economy, so there is no free labour or free capital, unemployed capital or unemployed labour you can get cheaply. And secondly, you don't have any money, so you've got to borrow it. So you therefore, <coughs> to actually be an entrepreneur, you can't just have a good idea, you've also got to get money, which means you have to borrow money. So he said an entrepreneur becomes successful as an entrepreneur, potential to be successful, by borrowing money. And he calls the banks that provide that money capitalists. I think that's a bit of a, a misclassification. But the, what you might see the banker is the venture capitalist. Okay, the, the, bank, the capitalist, the venture capitalist provides the capital, the money that an entrepreneur needs to turn an idea into an actual product. So entrepreneurs are fundamentally borrowers in Schopenhauer's vision. And then they're also the agent of evolutionary change because. When you come up with a new idea, you evolve the nature of some industry. So in that sense, Minsky, I'm an entrepreneur with Minsky, if I was actually trying to sell Minsky for a profit as a software package. That is an innovation in how you do system dynamics, and I might try to you know, take over the industry, but of course I'm not doing that. So he said net profit emanates from that development. If you bring in a new product, you produce something more cheaply than other people can produce that product, then the gap between the price it currently sells for and what you can produce it for is your source of profit. That's the easiest example to understand. It gives an example of um, back in the, the, uh, what, the 18th century, in the 19th century, the development of, of steam-powered looms. He said, imagine a steam-powered loom replaces eight workers who used to make um, cloth manually with one worker in the machine. He said, so long as the machine costs less than the seven workers to produce output over time, you make a profit. Okay. But you therefore, when you start selling that, you undercut the price of existing producers. So with that, you can repay your debt, you can retain a, a, a balance, which is your profit, and you take that out of the circular flow. So you then get net credit coming, the growth in credit, growth in money coming out of this entrepreneurial process. Entrepreneurs require money, they borrow the money, the money is created by the banks, that expands economic activity. And therefore money is essential. And he has this strange expression, but I think it's an important one to look at. It says in real life, total credit must be greater than it could be if they're only fully covered credit. By fully covered, he means money that's raised by selling existing goods. So he's saying total demand for goods is greater than that comes from just selling existing goods. It's also including credit created by the banking sector.
and you then ultimately, you know, argue to get to a new equilibrium. Um, but to get there, when you start selling these goods, you then have a negative impact upon existing industries. You have, you said, a complete reorganisation occurs, increases in production, uh, supersession of obsolete businesses, dismissal of workers. He says you get to a new equilibrium. I don't think you, but you do. You go down to a, from a burn to a slump. But you have uh, a surplus disappearing. The boom is followed by a slump. And they, in the process, the entrepreneurs take their profit. And this necessarily occurs in cycles. And this is a good explanation of why cycles occur. He says that they occur because the new combinations are not smoothly distributed through time. You might think that inventions come out randomly over time. But he says, in fact, they occur in clumps or swarms. He says there's three reasons why this will happen. That the vast majority of new combinations will not grow out of existing businesses. I think that's wrong. A lot of them do, but he said many of them compete with existing businesses. So then, actually undermining existing businesses when they come out. He says when entrepreneurial demand appears in mass. So you have, for example, let's say there's a dramatic increase in investment in solar technology. Then that causes a secondary boom because to produce those solar cells, you have to buy inputs from other factors. You've got to buy electronics. You even have to buy food for the workers. Well, the workers buy food. And said errors play a considerable role. Okay. <coughs> but the main thing is the, the secondary thing that when when you when you borrow the money to build a new factory, you expand demand, and that expansion of demand goes beyond your own sector. Because to produce the good you're producing, you have to produce inputs from other elsewhere. And because you borrowed new money into existence and spending that in other sectors, as well as causing a boom in your own sector, you cause a boom in other sectors. Then when you start selling those goods into the economy, you have profit in your sector, but you undercut existing businesses. So you cause a slump in the sectors you're competing with. So you get booms and slumps coming out of this. He says, so and one entrepreneur turning up facilitates others. So once, example, the dot-com bubble is the classic example there. Once the first few dot-com businesses started to form and got funded and grew dramatically, more and more dot-com businesses came forward and it was easier and easier to get money for dot-coms. And he said every boom will start in a particular industry. So we know we can talk about the 1990s period as being the telecommunications boom and the dot-com boom. The 2000s, we've got unfortunately the property bubbles all over the world. But a boom we can see happening to some extent now is in renewable technology. Renewable um, energy out of solar cells, energy out of wind systems, and so on. There's a boom going on in that industry. I said, so that actually, the growth of a boom causes an expansion of that industry and then other branches of industry as well. So you have impact well beyond your own sector. You cause an overall bubble at the beginning, but then a bust because during the boom, you're expanding activity, expanding net credit, expanding activity in your own sector, expanding it in other sectors, you're paying more wages, increasing rents. But once the innovation is produced, you have new goods and cheaper goods that undercut existing firms. And you start to repay the debt. So by repaying the debt, you're paying down the amount of money in circulation, having been a cause of an increase in debt and therefore an increase in money. When you start repaying it, you now cause a decline in money and a decline in debt. And that can cause a bit of deflation, which distresses other institutions. And he said, this period of from innovation to sale is what gives you both the boom and the slump. There's a period between when new products are devised and when they appear that explains how long the boom lasts. And then when they turn up, causes a fall in prices, terminates the boom, may lead to a crisis. He says must lead to a depression, but what he means by a depression is what we call the recession today. And then starts all the rest. So you go from boom to bust, boom to bust, all the way through. But in the process, you're increasing the size of the economy and you're transforming the nature of production. So that's his vision overall. 
finance plays an essential part of it. And his, here he sends up the view we still see in neoclassical theory today, because how do you finance investment? Well, the conventional barrier, so you, you find investment is financed by savings. That's the textbook argument. He says, well, that's not true. It doesn't come from people abstaining. Okay, to have, have investment financed by savings, people have to abstain from consumption. He said, so it's not an obviously absurd answer that it happens. Some of it would come that way. He said, there's another method for that, and that's the creation of purchasing power by banks. So again, he's got this vision of the endogenous creation of spending power. He said, it's not a question of transforming purchasing power that already exists, but the creation of new purchasing power out of nothing. So again, Schumpeter is in the tradition of the endogenous creation of demand by the banking sector. And ironically, uh, though you wouldn't expect it, this is supported by two of the main proponents of the efficient markets hypothesis, which were two of the main people to reject the argument that the banks play any role in the economy. But Famer and French, in, in one paper they published and another that it was a working paper they never actually published, they argue using really good empirical research, precisely what Schumpeter is arguing here, that change in debt finances investment. A remarkable set of papers. So this is back in 1999, this one was published. And they do a current, they, they took data from the uh, a very detailed American database of corporation annual, annual reports. And they then looked at uh, investment, uh, levels of equity and levels of debt, and did correlation analysis between the various theories. And they said that new issues of stock don't explain investment. Okay. There's, a, there's a small correlation between issuing shares and investment. Now, if you issue shares and sell them to people who themselves don't borrow money to buy them, then that is a redistribution of existing spending power. It's not a creation of new spending power. But they said, oh, you retain cash earnings do have a high correlation, so firms invest out of retained earnings. Okay. So that's a, a, a source of existing money to finance investment. But they said, the source of finance most correlated with investment is long-term debt. They said the correlation between investment at time t and change at long-term debt at time t is 0.79. And they were going over a period from 1951 to 1996, so almost half a, half a century of data. And so they strongly confirm that investment is financed by the change in debt. And they say debt plays a key role in accommodating year-to-year -year variations in investment. So even the most conservative neoclassicals, when they do empirical work, they end up supporting critics like Schumpeter rather than their own view. So that's Schumpeter. Um, now I'm going to start getting very complicated and talking about Marx. And I almost feel like we should take a break now before I do it. What do you think? Do we keep on going or...? How long to go? Ten minutes? Okay, well, brace yourselves. This is starting to get very heavy again. Into... Has anybody here read Marx? <laughs> okay, back in the past, you would all nodded your heads, wouldn't you? Okay. Okay. Mark, it's worth reading Marx, but not like you were taught him. Okay. Marx is, is a lot of wisdom in Marx and a lot of garbage, and you were taught the garbage. Okay. <laughs> so let's go through some of the decent stuff. Because when you really look into Eminsky's worldview, it does come from Marx, but not the labour theory of value. The stuff you were taught here, and the stuff that most Marxists around the world believe, I think is the, the bathwater of Marx that should have been thrown away. They threw away the baby instead. Now you will never find us you will not find a single quote from Marx in all of Minsky's work. Because, again, because of that, that witch hunt period, he couldn't admit to it. But he acknowledged it to his family, and I can give you an anecdote here, uh, because I've become friends with his, his son, Alan Minsky. And Alan and his father had a, a bit of a falling out in their 20s, like a lot of fathers and sons do. But in his 30s, Alan became Alan, Alan went and got involved in what they call indie media, the non-orthodox media. I think he's still working in indie media today. And, but in his 30s, he became interested in economics again. So he said he went to see his dad and said, now, what book would you recommend if I'm going to start reading economics? He said, Dad, when do we study? And he came out and he said, this is the one I'd get you to read. 
was Das Kapital, Volume 1. Okay? That was Minsky's first reference to give to his son to start learning about economics was Das Kapital. Okay? So that's how deep Minsky's acknowledgement is of Marx, but it's not the later theory of value stuff. So I've read you know, everything Minsky ever wrote and everything Marx ever wrote on economics, and I find a huge amount of Minsky's thinking turning up in a philosophical way in Marx in these particular references of Wundry. So theories of surplus value, and particularly volumes two and three in Capital, partly volume one as well in the first seven chapters, but not a lot. And I'm going to now be stepping right outside the mainstream, as well as being a critic of mainstream neoclassical economics. I'm also a critic of mainstream Marxian economics. In fact, the only death threat I've ever got came from a Marxist, not from a neoclassical. Okay. Now, a lot of people say you can ignore Marx's philosophy. I think it's absolutely vital that you understand his philosophy, not the labour theory of value. And you also would have heard, if you had done any study of Marx, people talk about Marx's dialectics being this idea of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. Now, those are three extremely hard words to pronounce. Okay. Uh, but it's actually not the dialectic that, that, that Marx used at all. It's actually the, the, the approach to dialectics, <coughs> called this thesis, antithesis, synthesis, actually comes from another philosopher I haven't read called Fichte. And in reading Marx and reading Hegel, and particularly reading Marx, I was looking for this thesis and synthesis synthesis. I never found it. I got another feeling for it, and then I read a beautiful book uh, by, an, I think he's an English author called Wilde, called Marx and Contradiction, written in 1989. And that was the best understanding I found, and completely consistent with what I could find in Marx. So I recommend taking a look at that, that book if you want to get a, a good short summary of Marx's philosophy, uh, Marx and Contradiction by Weil. And it's a simple version of what's called organicism in part of post-Keynesian economics coming out of Whitehead and what uh, Bhaskar called transcendental realism, which led to what's called critical realism today. So I see it as more sophisticated and simpler than their ideas. Now, Marx never said, this is my philosophy. He never wrote it down. Clearly, but if you read Capital and you read the Gundresa and so on, you can see it in the language and you can work it out from the language. And I think it overcomes all the problems of the classical school that enable the neoclassical school to become dominant, but it doesn't give you the labour theory of value. In fact, it contradicts it. So his dialectic uses the concept of unity, society, foreground, background, and tension. That's my so rather than thesis antithesis synthesis. That's what I see. Unity, society, foreground, background, tension. Let's put them together. That any component of a society, a human being, or a commodity or money itself, is a social unity. It's something, each of you as a person exists independently on your own right. You, know, you can walk out the door, you can fall asleep. Okay, you can, Your own behaviours are, are inherently... You are an, an object. Nothing else is needed to... I don't have to look at a puppet master making you move, okay? You're, you're self contained in that sense. So you have an existence in your own right, but you also must exist in a society. Okay? You have a relationship with everybody in this room, everybody in China, everybody in the world in various ways. So you can only be understood from the social context you're in. If you imagine if you meet somebody for the very first time at a social function, you might ask them, what do you do for a living? Or if you're a student, what's your degree? Okay? What do you mean a military officer? What's your rank? Okay, We think about our social relations all the time. Now, society itself will focus upon one aspect of that unity. So if you think about the modern capitalist economy, the normal question one person will ask somebody else is, what do you do for a living? Okay, So we focus upon the work you do. We don't ask, what do you do when you're not making a living? Okay. We actually focus on what you do for a living, not what you do for pleasure. So that necessarily pushes your what you do for work into the foreground, but you can't exist without what you do when you're not working as well. You're an integrated human being. You have you work, but you also have your own pleasures. So you can't be understood just from that foreground aspect. If somebody asks you, what do you do for a living, and you answer, I'm a student, that doesn't define you completely. <coughs> So you have a tension between your foreground and your background. You're a unity, okay? 
You're embedded in a society. Society focuses upon one aspect of you. It therefore ignores the others, but you can't exist without the others. So that will therefore cause social change. And the way I put this together in a diagram is that. Imagine that's society. Okay. And you imagine some unity that's embedded in that society. Then society will focus upon the foreground aspect, something that they society regards as more important than other aspects of that unity. But the background aspects still have to exist. So you've got a tension between the foreground and the background. And that's the basic model that I apply to put Marx's philosophy into a simple, coherent little model and see how he applies it. And the key one that he says is the key unity in a capitalist economy is the commodity. Okay. So the commodity is the commodity production of what's what defines capitalism compared to any other social system. So if you think about feudal social systems, you weren't producing commodities for sale. You were producing commodities as part of a feudal system to give pay taxes to a king, etc., etc. So he said the commodity is a unity of two aspects. And notice you'll see the language I've used turning up in this phrase. The first category of bourgeois wealth is the commodity. The commodity appears as a unity of two aspects. It's use value. So a commodity has to be useful to be saleable. So commodities at any time uh, has to have a use value, otherwise you can't sell it. And if you're just looking at the utility of something, usefulness, that's not something that's part of political economy. But he said use value becomes part of political economy when it intervenes in, modifies um, relations of production. How does that happen? Through exchange value. So you said in capitalism you produce something which has use value solely because you can sell it for its exchange value. And so he has, he, he, although directly united in the commodity, so the unity is the commodity, use value and exchange value are split apart. Okay? So the, for, the foreground for a commodity in capitalism is its exchange value, but its background is its use value. Okay? So there's a dialectical tension between the use value and the exchange value of a commodity. And I'll show you my little diagram of that. Pardon me. So you have the idea of capitalist society, the commodity is the unity. Capitalism focuses on exchange value. You produce commodities because you can sell them, not because they have use value, but they can't exist without use value. So there's therefore a tension between the exchange value and the use value. And that's the basic concept. I'll give you an example from the very first time I came to China, back in 1981, 82. And that was right back in the days when you know, the, the Deng Xiaoping had just come to power. Um, Madame Mao and her, her collaborators were on trial. The whole transformation was happening. So, and everybody was riding bicycles, okay, back, back in those days. And uh, we went to the Forbidden City and we were being taken on a tour of the Forbidden City, which is one reason I want to go back there and take a look at it. And you saw these incredible objects that the, the, the royal fam, that the emperor's family had. And one of those objects was an object shaped like this. So it, had a, it was made of gold, so solid gold up here, and it curved over, and then on this bit, it was studded with the most amazing rubies, emeralds, diamonds, huge gems. And I was taking a tour of Australian journalists with me, and one of them came up to me and said, Steve, what do you think this is? And I said, it's obvious, it's a back scratcher. Ha, ha, ha. I laughed and walked away. She caught up with me about half an hour. They said, I just checked, it is a back scratcher. So you had a back scratcher made of solid gold, studded with rubies. What you actually scratch your back with were incredibly expensive gems. That gold, that, that, that back scratcher, maybe in modern terms, would have cost two or three million dollars to make. Okay. It was made because of its utility. In a, in, a, in a feudal society, what appealed was the use value. You didn't care how expensive it was. You were the emperor. You wanted the back scratcher made of gold with expensive diamonds. You told somebody to go and make it for you. Okay? What's a back scratcher made of today in capitalism? It's a piece of plastic okay? made for one yuan. So 
so, social, um, feudal society focuses upon use value, doesn't worry about the exchange value. Capitalist society focuses upon the exchange value, the use value is less important. Okay? So this, this is the idea of an organising concept of exchange value and use value and a dialectical tension between the two. Now, this is Marx talking. Oh, you have a cut now? So we stop? Okay. Stop now and I'll keep on going after the break.